What sort of theme struck you most and what, you know, you sort of hope people come away with understanding about these soldiers' experiences? You want to, you want to start, Michael? Um, I mean, first of all, thank you for putting this together. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect tonight with this. And, um, I mean, it's interesting. This is the first experience I've ever had with watching a production on, on stage that's so intimately connected with my own life, and I was nervous it was going to be a total disaster, actually. Um, and it was. It was fantastic. It was extremely real. The actors did an incredible job, and I thought it treated uh, something really deeply important to me with a lot of respect. So thanks for that. I mean, I guess I would say, like, maybe this isn't a surprise for me for me because I was there, but I felt like, I mean, I knew these people, right? But I, I think a lot of a lot of us, maybe in the audience, felt the same way um, that we kind of knew these people, um, and, and I think that gets at something important. I mean, we do know these people. I mean, these people are us. Um, these people are the the sort of smattering of folks that come from all classes and walks of American life in this democratic society and go do our democratic society's will overseas when our elected leaders that we all vote for decide they should go. Um, and, you know, with respect, yeah, some of these guys are going to come home and wind up in our homeless shelters and on our blotters, but they're also going to wind up in our business schools. They're going to wind up in our universities. They're going to wind up running businesses. They're going to wind up in every walk of our lives. Um, the second we start to get away from that, the second we forget that, that these people are as much of us a product of our lives as our wars are, right? We, we've stopped taking responsibility for it. We're saying, okay, we've got this caste system. These other people are going to go clean up our garbage for us, and that's not right. Um, so, yeah, so, so I'm grateful to this production for showing, you know, these people as human beings, because I think they are. And their reactions to the war are as varied as, as every individual. You saw the lieutenant with his one reaction, where the NCO had his other reaction, the light and the darkness of human nature reflected in those two people in the reaction to the war. So, out on stage tonight, uh, obviously all services have been involved. Within those services, the reserve components, as it's technically referred to, but the, the people in the National Guard, the people in the reserves, they have been very heavily used. Uh, the families, um, Certainly, we, we, we got to see the perspective of, of mothers. Um, everyone knows that, in addition to mothers, there are wives and husbands and children who have been... And it's been a long line of military, every single generation all the way up to him. So, I mean, I think it's something that... And having met that family, that it is, I think, a great source of pride. And, and, and they have a... And even though they lost their son, they're still very... Um, I don't know how to explain it. They're uh, uh, very gracious um, people, and I think they sort of have an understanding of, of, of that all. And I, I don't know. It's something I, I, I never really had met. At doing the show now, I'm suddenly connected to all these uh, military families, so it's a very different sort of thing for me. As long as this is a democracy, I think there's got to be some sense of collective accountability for, for our collective choices. There's got to be some correlation between the votes we make and the consequences. And I don't think that it's, it's not morally acceptable to me, now I'm not arguing for a draft, but it's not morally acceptable to me that less than 1% of the people in my generation are out there paying the price for our collective choices. These are guys who, I mean, you talk about the thing, this thing, the moment of truth in the military, right? The moment of truth is that thing that happens when you don't have time to sit back and philosophize about your moral choices. You have to make a decision. And I'm talking about 19-year-old kids who will literally jump on a hand grenade for their friends. Mm. They don't have time to think about it. They just do it. it blows your mind. Yeah, I actually, I went to, I went to Columbia, and before I went to, as an officer in the Navy, and uh, before I went to Columbia, I was uh, paid for college, uh, serving in the Army in HEC 19, 7th ID Light, you know, over, I'm dating myself here, over in the uh, Just Cause. <laughs> So I'd like infantry, but um, yeah, the, there's a complete ambivalent. I just saw a, a stat that just came out last week, and correct, the numbers may be a little bit off, but 19, I think it was like 50, 54, um, Harvard uh, graduated 120 officers with commissions last year or two. Um, and I, I know when I was at Columbia, it was, it was a situation, especially in anthropology departments, like, what in the hell are you 
First of all, they think I'm a Republican right off the bat. They, 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 they assume that there's all kinds of weird crap that you know they think that I am, which is, and then, and then it's kind of funny because then they are in the military. Being an artist, they think I'm all left and smoking pot. So <laughs> and, and I can't. Really my concern is because we have an all volunteer force. Number one. So how many of the sons and daughters of the people in Washington are in uniform or in harm's way? How many of the 535 people on Capitol Hill ever rucked up and wore a uniform? Are we getting our money's worth, and are they going to work every day truly concerned about those troops who are in harm's way? That what's, that's what really concerns me. Are they doing their best every day to take care of these kids? Decision makers don't have the skin in the game, and that is to a certain degree problematic. And we even see that. Um, and that's why we respect the leadership. Um, like I had this uh, LT that rode in the two truck, with, um, the, the front truck. He rode in the, in the convoy for a guard. He was in the front truck, and he wasn't supposed to do that. He's got to be in the one truck, which is actually the second position truck. But the highest casualty rate is in the two truck, and he did that just put skin in the game, and everyone loved him. You know, whereas platoon sergeant sat in the back. He's in the six truck, and everyone's like, "What's this guy's you know deal?" And he was disrespected. So. You're absolutely correct, you know, that, that's definitely an issue. Time to prepare for <coughs> psychological casualties, time to deal with the mental state of the soldier, is before he goes into combat. That's when you do it. I think that's a key lesson of combat leadership that's, that's, that we've consistently failed <coughs> to learn. When you're teaching a guy how to do those combat tasks and how to kill him in the battlefield, you've got to teach him how to do it mentally and deal with it at the same time. And so Manhattan was complaining because he couldn't get anybody to go out with him on a Friday night and go have a good time at the bar. And he said, what, are we, what was everybody doing? He said, well, they all want to stay home and watch the war. Like, it's like, you know, Survivor. You know, the season finale or something. Right? <coughs> um, so there's an appetite for this stuff that feeds it. And I think it's, and, and all of a sudden, you know, it was, it was the next big thing, and now we've, got, we've all got war fatigue, and nobody cares anymore. I mean, you can go weeks without seeing anything about Iraq. Everybody thinks the Iraq war's over. I mean, we'll get guys blown. The guys are getting blown up every day. It's a weird thing. It was like a running joke, right? We had a television, and the, and everybody in Baghdad was just starting to get satellite TVs because of <coughs> the Baathist regime. You couldn't get a satellite TV. And so we got a satellite TV, too, and we watch everybody from Fox News to MSNBC, and they're live in 24-hour you know, coverage of Baghdad. And we'd be looking at the television screen going, God, I hope they don't send us to that city. <laughs> what a nightmare. I don't want to go there. <laughs> You know, and you were like eight blocks away. <laughs> it was like a totally fictitious universe coming through the television screen. Um, the TV news is just like absurd. I mean, one of the most surreal things I, I think I've ever seen is a line of, you know, memories hazy, 25 to 35 TV cameras. And you've got, you know, the guy doing the stand-up or the girl doing the stand-up in front of each camera and the producer screaming in the cell phone and they're sending their private security guys for pizza halfway across Baghdad. And they're all lined up filming five exhausted, blood-covered Iraqi firefighters at three in the morning pulling a little girl's body out of a rubble. And we've all been out there for 24 hours and it's a nightmare. And they're all just screaming on their satellite phones, getting the shot, trying to scoop each other. It's sick. And that's... But what you're seeing of that city is that straw that they show you, what's behind the stand-up guy. And anytime somebody's in suffering or pain or bleeding or doing anything dramatic, the straw moves. So it's looking at your, you're looking at this entire stage through a drinking straw that only follows death and suffering. And that's television news today. I, mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. I'm doing an interview, and uh, this, we're doing this interview because the reporter's in the green zone, which is kind of strange. But, okay, so I'm doing this interview with this guy, and back with the, Raj, with the Iraqi National um, Police, they're playing, uh, or Army, they're playing soccer. And you can hear him, and the guy blows a whistle. And the reporter grabs the microphone that I had, gave it to him, and goes, and in the background, you can hear the Iraqi regulars mustering up for war. And I'm like, you've got to be effing kidding me. <laughs> uh, and I, I was trying to, the, I couldn't do the interview after that, and that turned out to be a beat track. It was actually going to be aired for 360 in NPR. And, and it was just like, is this reporting? And yeah, and exactly what Michael said, it's absolutely brutal. So yeah, this, I love that analogy, I'll never forget that, this, the straw. That's exactly what it is. <laughs>